Hello, my friends. Thank you very much for joining. Welcome to the current state of affairs in project management. This is expressly for those friends of mine who have requested this. Those of you who got certified in 2010 and before. My goodness, what have you been doing? You've been you've been twiddling your thumbs, not keeping up to date. I'm just joking. We're going into what the current state of affairs is. Some of you studied Pembok Guide 2 and 3, my goodness, and 4. And you now want to be updated. Let me give you the skinny. The Pembok Guide, current Pembok Guide, is now the 7th edition. The 7th edition landscape has changed. Back in the day, we had 5 process groups and 10 knowledge areas alone. But now, things have changed. And the PMI is now heavily focused on the concept of principles for project management to rest squarely on. And we also have a different flavor of categorization or groupings, if you will. And it's called the eight domains of project management. So I am going to cover today the new PMBOK Guide 7th edition at a very high level for those of you experts who've been in the field for the past 15 plus years, some of you on to 18, 19 years, my goodness. So very quickly, you remember that the PMI have a code of ethics and professional conduct. Well, they have carved this out of the code of ethics and professional conduct going deeper. You know, in the world of agile, which some of you have dabbled into, we have four values and 12 principles. Well, the PMI now have 12 principles of project management. I'm going to cover them very quickly. The first one, if you go to the PDF that I shared with some of you, the first one is stewardship. And the summary of stewardship is you need to be a diligent, respectful, and caring steward. And what they mean by that is you should be respectful of the resources that have been entrusted to you. And some of the resources entrusted to you are going to be people like human, equipment, materials, supplies, facilities, and things such as that. In order to be a good steward, you want to first of all understand the scope of your responsibilities. And then you want to make sure that you're doing exactly what is expected of you. You're making sure that you are aware of laws and regulations so that you keep the project on the straight and narrow. Second principle is about teams. And when we talk about teams here, we're talking about collaboration. We're talking about team synergy. It's your job as a project manager to ensure that there's synergy within the team to make sure that you're giving the team the environment and support they need. Just as the Agile Manifesto encourages us, you're trusting them to get the job done. That's the summary. The third one is stakeholders. The stakeholder principle is really all about engagement. You know, it's not enough to have stakeholders who you are catering to on the project, they have to be engaged. So you want that environment, that atmosphere of uh, engagement. The next one is value. Some of you already know this from the world of Agile. And it's really the concept of don't do it if it doesn't offer value, right? If it offers value, do it. Anything you do should be value. You want to be value oriented. One of the things we talk about in the world of Agile is being lean. So this is really cutting out the fat, thinking about value stream mapping and optimization and just doing things that are value driven. Um, it's not enough for you to deliver um, a solution. The solution should be valuable. All right. The next one is systems thinking and being a systems thinker means you're a big picture thinker. To be a systems thinker, you should be able to see the big picture view of the project and all the variables that affect the project. Have you ever worked with someone who is a minutia kind of thinker? They're like on the ground level and they cannot see the 40,000 foot view. PMI is saying, while it's important to be a person who sees the small details, you want to be able to see the big picture because that's where integration responsibilities of the project manager come in. All right. Next one that we talk about here is leadership. You know, great John Maxwell, my mentor, he says everything rises and falls on leadership. And then he says a true measure of leadership is influence. So the truth is to be a great project manager, 
you need to be a great leader. You need to be a great, you know, influencer. And I'm not talking about the social media influencers. I'm talking about someone who can truly persuade and inspire and encourage and motivate the people around them, whether they be up in the organization, sideways, down. That whole mindset is what they're talking about in this principle. Next one is tailoring. You've got to tailor the processes according to your project. The funny thing is when people hear about the PMI, they think, oh, I got to apply all these, every single pro process and tool to my project. And that's not the case. You got to tailor them. You got to tailor them based on size, based on complexity, based on the stakeholders' preferences and so on. All right. The next one is quality. What is quality? I could ask you that question. Quality is many things to, to many people, but in my mind, it's four things. It's fitness for use, conformance to requirements, customer satisfaction, and Kaizen. And when you uphold these things, you are in the quality vein. So PMI says, maintain a focus on quality that produces deliverables that meet project objectives and align to the needs, uses, and acceptance requirements set forth by relevant stakeholders. All right. Now we're on to number nine. Number nine is complexity. When we talk about complexity, we want the project manager to understand that there's a way of dealing with complexity. And that way is one, to break things down into smaller pieces. And number two, just be agile. Think agile, be agile in all that you do. So the PMI says continually evaluate and navigate project complexity. Do you folks remember the Stacy complexity model? Well, that's a good thesis for this, because all throughout a project or endeavor, you should be navigating complexity, right? PMI says, so that the approaches and plans enable the project team to successfully navigate the project lifecycle. Now, when you think about complexity, there are two dimensions. There's the dimension of requirements, certainty, and there's the dimension of technical certainty. And when you are in a region where you have high requirement uncertainty and high technical uncertainty. In other words, you're on a project where people don't understand what to do and how to do the little that they know, you're going towards complexity and very quickly spiraling into chaos and spiraling into what we encourage people to come away from, which is move down on that y-axis away from high level of uncertainty to greater certainty in your requirements and move back towards the zero point on the x-axis towards a greater level of certainty about the technicality right so this is more like advanced agile talk for those who have been there but i know you graduates you pmp graduates you should be up to the task so when you're looking at complexity you got to reduce something. You got to come away from that chaos mode, right? You got to come away from that madhouse. And the way you do it is breaking it down into smaller pieces. And you also influence the requirement certainty and the technical certainty. Next, we go into risk. Risk is all about uncertainty that can impact the project. And what we want to do here, you know, the PMI has given us the seven things we need to do. How many of those things do you remember? Chat into me. Do you remember any of the seven things PMI says you should do? Any of the seven processes? Chat into me. Let me see if you can even give me one before, <laughs> before I'm done. The first one is you got to plan risk management. Then you got to identify risks. Then you got to perform a qualitative risk analysis. A quantitative risk analysis is optional. Plan risk responses, implement risk responses, and monitor risks. Did you even remember any of them PMPs? <laughs> PMPs from 2005, 2004. Yeah, hopefully you've been doing this stuff on your projects. But, but the summary is the PMI says continually evaluate exposure to risks, both opportunities and threats to maximize positive impacts and minimize negative impacts to the project and its outcomes. So you at all times, you need to be thinking, where are my risks? Am I dealing with my risk the right way or am I just freewheeling? And the PMI is encouraging you. These are principles, right? They're telling you continually evaluate the exposure. You're always thinking, how exposed are we? Are there hidden risks? And so on. 
All right, two more. Number one is adaptability and resiliency. So PMI is just saying you got to be adaptable, right? Being adaptable is code for agile, right? Build adaptability and resiliency into the organization's and project team's approaches to help the project accommodate change, recover from setbacks, and advance the work of the project. The final one is the change principle. And the change principle is all about being prepared for change. It says, prepare those impacted for the adoption and sustainment of new and different behaviors and processes required for the transition from the current state to the intended future state created by the project outcome. So the idea is we don't just force people into change. No, we embrace change, but we're also champions for change. And we also understand the importance of sense-making sessions where change is concerned because people need to understand the change before they adopt the change. So if you're not helping people to understand the change, you can be rest assured people are not people are not want to gonna want to go along. Okay. All right. So those are the 12 principles. The second part of the PMBOK Guide Seventh Edition, and, and this is gonna go very quick, is what we call the eight performance domains. Okay. This is in the second PDF that I put in the chat for you guys. All right. So the PMI says in that publication, if you can read it, a project performance domain is defined as a group of related activities that are critical for the effective delivery of project outcomes. Now, someone would say, but Phil, how do, how do project performance domains differ from knowledge areas? And I say there's overlap. And someone says, but Phil, how does it differ from process groups? And I say again, there's overlap. Personally, I would not have created performance domains. I would have left everything alone as knowledge area categorizations and process group categorizations because it makes sense. But the performance domains, and these will make absolute sense to you because, like I said, there's overlap. The first performance domain is stakeholder. The second performance domain is team. The third performance domain is development approach and life cycle. The fourth one is planning. The fifth one is project work. Number six, delivery. Number seven, measurement. And number eight, uncertainty. Let's go through these super quick. Stakeholder. This is a domain of importance because the stakeholders are the reason for which you have the project. The same way you think about stakeholders in the knowledge areas is the same way we do in the performance domain. Effective stakeholder interaction contributes to successful project outcomes. It's pretty straightforward, 101. The next domain is team. As a project manager, we want to be hyper-focused on the team. This lives within the resource management area in the PMBOK 6, and it's pretty much the same idea of Let's have some team leadership. Let's have a team charter or some social contract to guide the team, right? It says the team performance domain addresses activities and functions associated with the people who are responsible for producing project deliverables that realize business outcomes. It's that simple. It's not rocket science, honestly. Next one is development approach and life cycle. Here's the thesis. As a seasoned project manager, you want to make sure that you can tailor the life cycle to your project. Don't use an agile approach only when you need to be hybrid. Don't use a predictive approach when you need to be agile. And it reads the development approach and life cycle performance domain addresses activities and functions associated with the development approach, cadence, and life cycle phases of the project. The project deliverables determine the most appropriate development approach, such as a predictive, adaptive, or hybrid approach. The deliverables and the development approach influence the number and cadence for project deliveries. So imagine you're working on a software application where you could deliver in increments and work in iterations. In other words, you could do it agile, but because you haven't given it thought, 
you are delivering one time at the end of 12 months. What a waste of opportunity because you could have capitalized in on it, just like software companies these days, and you could have delivered incremental value. You would have been able to get feedback quicker. You would have been able to deliver some value quicker. So PMI is encouraging you to think about the cadence of your iterations, the cadence of the deliveries, and just in general, the life cycle. Even if it's hybrid, you still need to properly engineer a hybrid approach. I have a question. Oh, go for it. So is there still room for the tool? I mean, where do the tools and techniques weave into this? Is it no longer a separate, a lot, you know, they no longer separate yeah. define what tools and techniques apply? Great, to great question. About yeah. Agile, but Yes, very good question. So the Pembroke Guide 7th edition is less focused on tools and techniques. It is more focused, hyper-focused. The first thing you see, as you heard us cover, is the principles. And then on top of that, it's the understanding of the mechanics of the activities that are done. Not necessarily the how of the tools and techniques yet. That comes in the final part of Pembox 7, which we will not go into great depth today, but I'll just say that the tools and techniques, the language is now methods, models, and artifacts. Methods, models, and artifacts. And a lot of the regular suspects are still there, like the artifacts are still there. Project management plan, risk management plan, risk register, all that stuff is there, but it does not take the front seat in the narrative. It's kind of on the back end if you know what I mean. So it's there, but our focus for the first two parts of the PMBOK guide is all about principles and then understanding the activities. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay. I'm hoping, hoping that that gives you some clarity. If you check on the Prazion channel, we have an extended video that goes into all of the methods, models, and artifacts. It's about a hundred items compared to about three or 400 in previous editions of the PMBOK guide. So great question. So the next domain is planning and I'll just leave it as is straight up. It's just planning, scope, schedule, cost, quality, resources, communications, risk, procurement, and stakeholder. That's pretty much it. And then we have the project work performance domain. So for clarity, the PMI say this addresses activities and functions associated with establishing project processes, managing physical resources, fostering a learning environment. So those, those are pretty much the things you think about. It says project work is associated with establishing the processes and performing the work to enable the project team to deliver the expected value and outcomes. Project work includes communication, engagement, managing physical resources, procurement, and other work to keep project operations running smoothly. Now that's an oxymoron. You know, the language is loosey-goosey. Project operations, they just mean the regular grind on the project. That's all they're talking about. All right. Next, we go into delivery, right? And delivery is just what it sounds like. Delivery performance domain addresses activities and functions associated with delivering the scope and quality that the project was undertaken to achieve. So I know what you're thinking, fellow project managers. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, well, okay, you're mentioning all these nebulous domains. Are there processes as part of these domains? No. There are sub-steps but they do not document this the same way Pembox 6 did, which is why, which is why the PMI found that people still had a need for more specificity in the processes. And that's why we have process groups, a practice guide, which is a totally different document where all of these other processes you folks are aware of, like the 49 regular processes, they are upheld in a different publication. Talk about being confused. Well, you're not confused because your buddy Phil is helping you understand it. Okay. Any questions in addition to the first one we got? Yeah, so I just heard you say there is a separate document. So if we were to 
get texts, we would get the seventh edition plus the process groups of practices, guide. Exactly. You got to look on PMI's website. Process groups of practice guide took the back part of Pembox six, where it's broken down by process group, and they now made they fleshed that out into an entire guide that didn't lose the legacy five process groups, 10 knowledge areas, 49 processes. Because what PMI is realizing that people still need that stuff. People want that stuff. And a lot of government institutions and private companies, they still want that stuff. Exactly. So they made it available. Yeah, because Pembox 6 is out of publication, by the way. You can't find it to buy and you can't even download it from PMI site. So they're pushing the process groups of practice guide and that's okay. The information hasn't gone away. It's just living somewhere else. And then they also have PMI Standards Plus, where you can get electronic versions of some of this stuff. So it's not gone away and it's not irrelevant. PMI never said it's irrelevant. They just spun it differently in Pembox 7. Personally, I would have left things as they were. But now that they've gone down this path, we, we got to find where the legacy stuff is that many companies have invested like hundreds and thousands, some millions of dollars on training using Pembox 6 framework and they're going to throw it away. So it's all about knowing where the content is. Yeah. What do they, how do they weave that content? How do they mention, how do they reference the process groups of practice guide, if at all, in the seventh edition? How do they connect the seventh edition to that from a great legacy? Question. Great question. So the, so the process groups of practice guide was published after Pembox 7. Uh, after people like your buddy Phil, the Raven Lunatics, was saying, this is not enough. Pembox 7, I appreciate the fact that we need principles, but what I don't like is moving away from PMI legacy. Let's keep it intact. And it sounded like this guy is delusional. What's wrong with him? But later on, when the noise levels in industry became so high, then they released Process Groups of Practice Guide. After people were asking, who moved my cheese? Where's... You know, so it's not mentioned in Pembox 7. And, you know, that's why there's a lot of confusion in the PMP space because people have no idea how to study for the exam, except they have expert help because you have Pembox 6, some copies still floating around. You have Pembox 7, you have the PMP exam content outline, then you have process groups of practice guide, then you have the agile practice guide, five publications, one exam. You see what I'm saying? So that, that's a good question, but um, the reference is not made in, in the seventh to uh, process groups of practice guy because it came after. It's almost like, was it an afterthought? Probably. I don't know. What was the other what? document that you mentioned for the exam? Is there like an outline document now that they have for the exam? Yes. Yeah, so this used to be a document the PMI would sell back in the day when you took the exam. It was about thirty nine ninety nine, But PMI now makes this available for free. And it's called the PMP exam content outline. And you can find this by just Googling PMP exam content outline. It's a document that breaks the PMP exam down into people, process, and business. Another set of domains, if I may add. The people domain is 42% uh, of the exam. The process domain is 50% of the exam. And the business domain is 8%. And then there are 35 tasks that are mapped to all these domains. So you have people, 14 tasks, uh, process, 17 tasks, and business, four tasks. So, I mean, if you really wanted to go for the kill on this stuff, I would encourage going to my uh, page. It's pmp.pmradio.org. That's pmp.pmradio.org. And for about 17, 18 hours, I am covering all the 30 35 tasks for free on youtube so for those listening who are like how do i get more training for, uh, in, from this guy on the 35 tasks well just go to pmp.pmradio.org and i have to be quite honest it's going to about 30 hours of content because i've been curating this and helping people because people are, people are confused and not knowing how to study for the exam right yeah, so really i made this Yep, it sounds really confusing. I mean, thank you for walking through all of this. Because I, I, if I were to study for the exam today, I don't know that I would have 
known all of this information so thank you for absolutely that. and that's exactly what people are saying in the chat you know to the exam would be very hard because back in the day back in uh early 2000s when people would take the test it would be okay it's either pen book two or pen book three and and that's it that you know and then there was some auxiliary materials but you didn't have a little bit of agile here a little bit of predictive here a little bit of domains from one place here a little bit. so so anyway but but thank you for the question great great question so process groups of practice guide um you can find that on pmi's website if you are a member you can download it all right let's go back we got only a couple left and we're done so the next one is is the obvious one right i think we've done delivery now we're doing measurement so the measurement performance domain addresses activities and functions associated with assessing project performance and taking appropriate actions to maintain acceptable performance. So if you've ever created a report with metrics, traffic lights, uh, maybe you had to put in some numbers, that's what this is talking about. One of the things I like about this chapter is the PMI accentuates the importance of not measuring for measuring sake. You don't want to be measuring vanity metrics that are worthless you know some people have a habit of getting sucked into vanity metrics and and pmi is saying don't do that make sure that whatever you're measuring it, it's sensible so ask the five whys you don't want to be like a team that was asked to measure how many defects have you found and management is asking how many defects have you found because management wants to reward people for finding defects so the development teams you know ends up being in cahoots with the testing team and the testing team are finding a lot of defects because their buddies in the development team are making the defects so the testing team can get get bonuses and that's the wrong thing to measure you know or you're measuring that for the wrong reason or why even mention that so we got to be careful what we're measuring the pmi says measurement involves assessing project performance and implementing appropriate responses to maintain optimal performance that's a general idea there's, there's some things that you don't just use as a gauge. Another example would be using velocity as a gauge for team health. It's even sensible because as we know from the world of Agile, velocity has many parameters surrounding it, many variables, many dependencies, one of which is capacity, right? One of which could be the general complexity of whatever is being worked on at that particular point. So we've got to be careful that we're measuring the right stuff. The final one here is uncertainty. And the uncertainty performance domain addresses activities and functions associated with risk and uncertainty. Projects exist in environments with varying degrees of uncertainty. And uncertainty presents threats and also opportunities that project teams explore and assess and then decide how to handle. So risk, uncertainty, that whole mantra that comes in the final domain. So just to cover one more time, we have stakeholder performance domain, team, development approach and life cycle. We have planning altogether as one domain, project work as one domain, delivery, measurement, and finally uncertainty. And that my friends is PMBOK guide seventh edition for bosses, PMP boss ladies, PMP bosses certified way back in the day. Honestly, this is all you need to know. I would say that the way you've been doing stuff so far is great. The only thing some of you need to add is a little bit just do a tiny titration of some agile and then and then amp up on the agile because if you're not being agile in 2024 as a pmp you've missed the boat and i know many of you didn't have agile on your exam some of you have taken uh the csm uh, but i want to encourage you those of you who haven't taken any agile exam you might want to go to our website it's agileprinciple.com because a lot of PMPs are coming through trying to get ACP certified. So if if you are a PMP, perhaps the next logical thing is for you to begin to practice agility, for you to learn it, for you to get your hands and feet wet, for you to come on a journey. You know, it's like going on this pilgrimage journey where you're going into agile world with my buddy Roy and I. And by the time you're done, you're going to come out. You know, as as not just it's not the certificate, I have to be honest, because going for the ACP with us is more about the journey than the certificate. The certificate's great, but the journey is going to accentuate you to how to to apply agility 
and agile thinking to your project. So again, that website is agileprinciple.com. And um, thank you, my friends, all of you who joined today. Um, any final questions in the chat or anything? Yes, I do have a question, Phil. What, how does the Agile Practice Guide on the PMI align, if at all it does align, with the CSM exam? Or the- that's, a, that's a very good question. So the Agile Practice Guide is a totally disconnected document off the grid of the Scrum Alliance. Um, the Agile Practice Guide was written as a collaboration between the PMI and the Agile Alliance. And we do know the Agile Alliance do not spe do not specialize in certifications. So even though they've written the Agile Practice Guide, the Agile Alliance is not testing anyone on it, but it is there. The, uh, the closest you get to being tested on the Agile Practice Guide is on the PMP exam, where there's some Agile, and definitely on the ACP exam. Uh, and then some, maybe some of uh, PMI's other um, Agile exams they have. They got some micro exams as well. But as far as the CSM, the CSM is more based on the Scrum Guide from um, um, Ken Schwaber and Jeff Sutherland, the co-creators of Scrum. And you can say that the Scrum Alliance, uh, you know, has a lot of dominance in industry with the CSM. Does that explain? Well, so I guess what I'm really getting at is if you read the Agile Practice Guide, does it correspond? Does it? Am I am I getting the same information as what I would have picked up from the Scrum Guide, or are they completely two different? Um, are, are they in sync in terms of thought? Yes, or so great, great question. So I'll just give you some examples. So the Agile Practice Guide was written way back. I think the date on that thing is um, probably 2017 when Pembox 6 came out. Now, if you take a look at the most current Scrum Guide, Scrum Guide from uh, Scrum guides.org that's 2020 so that's three years and you do know in the world of tech three years is big so some of the ways that we were thinking in in the agile practice guide uh for example it talks about uh collecting no no more than three uh things to improve on at the end of a retrospective well that mindset has long since gone ken and jeff change the mindset of, oh, you must get at least one thing to improve on in the retrospective. No, all of that regularity and prescription has gone away. So now what they are espousing is if you need to improve, go ahead and improve at any time. There's no onus on you to have at least one or two or, and you know, we don't limit things. So limiting language that forbids you from doing things in a particular way or says you cannot have more than three items. And I'm referring to page 59 in the Agile Practice Guide for those who are uh, wondering, there's a prescription of, oh, do this. We're moving away from prescriptive things uh, in the world of Scrum in 2020. In fact, there are a number of things that were changed in the Scrum Guide. Generally, there is some sync, but if you really wanted to drill down like a, like a good Agilist and, and be honest and take a look at some of these things, some of some of the language there and ideas may be a little bit uh, obsolete now in in the agile community. Things move um, well agilely because it's agile, right? So um, the agile practice guide and the Scrum guide, even though the people who wrote the agile practice guide, they have deep insights to Scrum guide, but they were using. You got to remember it was an it was an old Scrum guide. Um, so a lot has changed. It's it's changing all the time. But so, I would say it's not far off. It's not so far off that you would be lost. Now, you've got to remember, let me point this out. The Agile Practice Guide is Agile focused. The Scrum Guide is Scrum focused. So there's a lot of stuff in the Agile Practice Guide. You see it's about 160 something pages. There's a lot of stuff in that document that is not in the Scrum Guide. Because Scrum Guide is 13 pages, hyper-focused on the 353. The Agile Practice Guide is a, is a book for all seasons. It has the Agile Manifesto Values and Principles. It has a blurb about Lean. It has that image on page 13 about Lean. It has a Stacy model on page 14. It has the Life Cycles on pages 19 and 20. It has all of this iterative-based Agile, flow-based Agile, servant leadership, practices of Agile in an agnostic way, going into the radar chart for your organization to know if it's ready for Agile, Agile PMOs. I mean, it's a huge book. It's like 10 plus times, 12 times bigger than the Scrum Guide. 
So it's not an apples to apples comparison. Does that help? Yes, that does help. So uh, yes, absolutely. And and so for the purposes of an exam, if I were to take the uh, ACP, you would recommend to focus on the Agile Practice Guide, correct? That is largely right. So in our ACP course, my buddy Roy and I, we've written the book, you can find it on Amazon, it's called Agile Principle, Raw and Uncut. And what we've done in that book, we've magnified Agile even way beyond the Agile Practice Guide, because we're going in on every one of those values, principles, mindsets, some of the other practices and frameworks. We blow them out. We go into Kanban, right? The Scrum mm -hmm. Guide doesn't go into Kanban. Agile Practice Guide goes into it a bit, but we blow stuff out with a lot of imagery. And then we have a whole bunch of exercise at the back of the book. So those going into the, to the Agile uh, uh, professional practitioner exam, uh, we encourage them to get our book, um, Agile Principle Run and Cut. And to actually read that book and, and to take all the exercises at the back. So if anyone is interested in that, you can find that book on Amazon as well. Awesome. Okay. Well, thank you. All uh, right. Thank you. Thanks for the questions and all of our other friends who joined. I want to thank you. Those of you who have been certified, we, we, we understand how you wanted to get caught up and hopefully you're caught up. If there are any questions after the meeting, don't hesitate to send an email. You can send an email to support at praiseon.com. If you want to join the Agile course going on, go to agileprinciple.com. For those of you PMPs who want to join our PMP course, go to hpmexam.com. And for those of you who want to study on your own, you can find our PMP exam immersion book on Amazon. You can also find our Agile Principle Run and Cup book on Amazon. Thank you very much. All the very best and bye for now.